I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Glad to be here and glad to have you along. Today is Thursday, July 28th, 2022. Thursday's cool day for me. I simply hang out with friends of mine. I call our, our group the Companions and kind of open invitation, open architecture. Uh, anybody who's available shows up and we talk about things that are important to us. Uh, in our personal lives, our community lives, our cultural lives, our spiritual lives, uh, our national lives, whatever uh, identity and community mean to us, uh, I simply say, hey, uh, sister, hey, brother, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about today? And so today, what I want to do is invite uh, uh, you who may be joining us by either Facebook or YouTube, if you're joining us by Twitter or um, LinkedIn. I'd love to have you uh, be part of this companionship, be a friend. And I'm asking you what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? What's important to you? So why companions? I, I've been talking about uh, this series of books I've been reading. Uh, and I come to the series of books through being a member of a, a new online community called Narrative. I'm wearing the gear. Narrative is the word narrative with a K. And the easy way to remember it is like knowledge. You know, knowledge, you spell it with a K. Narrative, the same word normally you spell with N, but with a K. The companion organization to that is called Nubia. You know, common sense says N-U-B-I-A, but this is Nubia with a K as well. And these are kindred online communities being created by our people for our people to reflect our capacity and the need uh, and the plausibility of us building a narrative and relationships a system of governance uh, between and among us that will move our people towards freedom it's a community that invites us to always ask the question about anything. And the question we must always ask is, what does it mean to our freedom? Any discussion, any uh, consideration uh, beneath that has to come the question. And so what does this mean for our freedom, our liberation, our completion as uh, an Africana community, as Black people? And so I've been through them uh, involved in a series of wonderful uh, explorations, adventures, learnings, uh, knowledge acquisition, uh, discovering what they have described and we are describing as an Africana way of knowing or of learning. The premise behind this, and let me say, first of all, thanks to Dr. Karen Hunter. Uh, she's a, an award-winning journalist and broadcast personality a blogger, personality, and award-winning educator teaching journalism at the university level, I think at Hunter College in New York. And her uh, colleague, the on-camera colleague, Dr. Greg Carr, head of Africana Studies at the university, at Howard University, among other things. But Dr. Carr and Dr. Hunter, for about 120 weeks so far, so well into two years, have been having uh, at minimum a weekly session of a conversation just like this. They call it in class with CAR. And it happens every Saturday morning, I think at eight o'clock Eastern time or nine o'clock Eastern time. And they built an audience of over a thousand, sometimes 2000 people tuning in to hear what you might call a lecture, but it's bigger than different from a lecture. Uh, it's a conversation between two people that know, and then they have it structured so people who are calling in can either add or raise questions or criticize, but there's engagement to those. What they did was discovered that the world was changing as a consequence of, of COVID-19. And as institutions and mobility and personal contact all uh, sort of tamped down due to necessity, what did that mean for things like the university or public school? 
and they decided that they should have a learning environment, a learning experience where a professor like Professor Carr or like Professor Hunter uh, could talk about what they knew, share information, do what teachers do, but it wouldn't be a class you have to pay for. It wouldn't be something that you get quote unquote credit for. It would be a chance for you to understand the power of your own mind, your own thinking, your ability to analyze uh, the world, analyze the current context, and to map out uh, both questions and answers that suit your experience and your expectations for yourself and for humanity. And so they allowed themselves to question what the real value, the real deliverable has been for education as we understood it, the ivory tower, the university, the campus, and all of the business behind that, that is unseen, but is the driving force. And so they discovered that uh, there is an energy and an interest in the community for knowledge acquisition, for knowledge sharing uh, that is, does not depend on the institution, the ivory tower to validate it, to uh, provide it, but that between us and among us using technology, we can create an exchange of knowledge, innovation, information that improves us the way education ought to. Education around learning, knowledge acquisition, and not so much around validation or approval or uh, certification, which is what the institutions we call colleges and universities do. So they've been doing this. So as, as a consequence of, um, of tuning into that, I, uh, you know, I love the fact that uh, every time Dr. Carr was on, he'd be sitting in a room like I'm in now. And he's sitting in a room that's like a, a cockpit in an airplane, it seemed to me. This is my visualization of his space environment. And he'd have a gazillion books all around him. He had to top to bottom of the room, books to the right, books to the left. Uh, he'd get up and make reference to a book and reach down and find the book and say, oh, here it is. Or he'd walk off camera for a second and come back with the book and say, this book is so-and-so. He'd turn to a page, well, it says on page 200, and he'd read something he'd underlined. And he'd be able to reference uh, the conversation, whatever it was, with literature, with text, uh, with examinations of the idea by scholars, by thinkers, by uh, artists, uh, by doers who documented what they have done in the form of books. So one of the uh, people that was mentioned a few times uh, that I've become sort of enamored with is the Ghanaian author Aikwe Arma. Aikwe Arma is um, a Ghanaian who uh, I'm looking at the back of this book of his, uh, says the author from his first novel, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, to his latest essays, Aikwe Arma has advocated a rebirth of African society inspired by ancient knowledge of our unity and an understanding of what we can achieve. Since 1980, Arma, has lived and done his writing in Senegal, West Africa. And he writes uh, through a company, a publishing company called Per Ankh. And I don't know if you can see here, at the bottom of this is a symbol. And the symbol is in uh, ancient uh, Egyptian, it's hieroglyphic. The symbol means, uh, Per Ankh means the house of light. Per, house, and Ankh, light. This is house of light. So they've created a company called Per Ankh Publishing, or House of Light. Per Ankh is an African publishing cooperative funded and managed by a worldwide group of friends. It runs a workshop for beginning writers. That workshop is called Per Sesh. And uh, it does that in the seaside village of uh, Popengwain, Popen I may be saying it wrong, Senegal. So. Uh, I started grabbing uh, all of the books by uh, Aikwe Arma. And then you see the stack of books over here. Uh, 
I'm like ordering books all day, every day, because I'm so impressed and excited and motivated by what I see. This, the, this is the power of an image. I'm so impressed by what I see with Dr. Carr and with Karen. So, uh, you know, I love books. I've got libraries in my basement, libraries in my office upstairs. And let me bring a, a miniature representation of that to this setting that I'm in. And I love the way that Dr. Carr would always reach back and grab. So if I'm talking, I'll look and grab Metu Netter. Uh, I can reach back and grab uh, something uh, called The Voices of Harlan Renaissance or Osiris Rising, the book by uh, Ikwe Irma. Uh, I have uh, books that are published by Per on publishing that are, are translations of ancient writing in several languages. Let me show you what I mean. This is a book entitled uh, On Love Sublime, right? And uh, what I love about it is that it's a poem, a love story, but it's presented simultaneously in several languages. Uh, and so inspired by that, in the past couple of weeks, we launched an Insight News, uh, a recasting of what we've done before called Afro Descendientes. We're presenting stories being created by one of my editors who's in Colombia, he's back in Venezuela now, writing in Spanish, another colleague uh, who's in Bahia is translating those into Portuguese. I am translating them into English. And our intent, and I've made the contact, is to also translate those same stories into Yoruba, perhaps eventually Somali uh, or French. What's the idea? Well, this is a model. Uh, and even though I read the English, I can read the Spanish. Uh, I have a feeling for the Portuguese and the French. I'm not competent in those. but all of it tells me that these things are accessible to me and that these languages, these idioms are things that I can possess and walk in and live in and use to reflect my identity, my interest, my future. And my goal then following the model of Per Ankh is to be able to present stories in several languages side by side insight in Insight News. Well, I'll stop there. Uh, I'll go on and on. Uh, I'm glad to have this moment to speak with you. I see my colleague, Dr. Erman McLaren is here and my co-host Brenda Lyle Gray is here. Let me bring you guys in. And uh, maybe, uh, Boss, you could bring up the current paper, the Insight News. I want to give kudos to my friend, uh, Brenda Lyle Gray, for an excellent piece she did based on the interview that she and I did. Let me flip to page three. Uh, the interview was with the candidate for mayor of Brooklyn Center. Uh, her name is April Graves, and Brenda just did a marvelous job in telling that story, bringing her story to life and sharing it. And hopefully, you know, she'll have a successful uh, campaign to be uh, the first Black woman mayor of Brooklyn Center in the Twin Cities here. With that, uh, hello, guys. How are you? And welcome, and thank you for being here. Hey, Al. Pleased to be here. Uh, I'm talking to you from Grinnell, Iowa, where I am actually here uh, to be part of a planning committee for the 50th reunion anniversary of my class of 1973. Wow. Oh, <laughs> so oh, in 1969, no. Grinnell College, which has about 1,280 students, admitted its first critical mass of Black students. There were 18 of us. And as far as I can tell, 15 of us are still living. And so I'm representing, what can I say? I'm here to represent. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So we're, Grinnell, the town is Grinnell, right? So Grinnell was, uh, Grinnell College was founded by J.B. Grinnell, who apparently uh, saw a slave auction and was horrified mm -hmm. and established this college, which has been admitting black students, small numbers uh, since the 1800s. And it is a very elite college. It is the wealthiest college in the state of Iowa. It probably ranks up there uh, in terms of its uh, its uh, endowment with some of the big the big names that we know, mm -hmm. uh, namely because it had some really interesting people teaching here. Uh, one was uh, 
Henry Noyes, who invented the Intel circuit chip, was a student who dropped oh. out and then came back and then taught here and left them some Intel stock. Uh, Dan Forth, who was of the Dan Forth, what used to be called the Dan Forth Teaching Fellow, mm -hmm. was a professor here. And apparently from the patents he made around paints and stuff, he created the endowment, uh, the Dan Forth Teaching Fellowship, but also apparently only took a dollar a year for his salary, or so mm -hmm. the story goes. So it's got uh, the founder of the Des Moines Register, uh, Rosen, I think it's Rosenwald, uh, who founded the Des Moines Register. He had this really interesting friend named Warren Buffett who used to advise him about how to invest sure. Grinnell's endowment. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> money, money, money. Well, that's good. And uh, the reputation of Grinnell, you know, there's some other schools in Iowa that have strong reputations as well uh, that black kids, black young people went to. Do you know some of them? Well, Grinnell is part of what's called the Associated Colleges of the Midwest. And mm -hmm. so you have, uh, you know, small colleges like Carleton and St. Yeah. Olaf. In um, Minnesota, yeah. In Minnesota, you have McAllister, you have Cornell in Iowa, not mm -hmm. in Ithaca, New York. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you had Co College. So these were all part of this yeah. consortium. And what they did was to share resources. And so I participated in an ACM program that took me to India in 1971, 72. Uh, and so it, it's provided opportunities, but most of them outside of Oberlin, which has a historic reputation of actually admitting black students early on. And that's where Coretta Scott King got her degree from. Mm -hmm. And so they have a much stronger, shall we say, trend of, of enrolling Black students in larger numbers than some of the other schools. But all of them, to some extent, had uh, you know, a population, small numbers, three, four, five. And when the 60s came, they sort of participated in the desegregation. I would say the desegregation of colleges, pro white colleges, what we call predominantly white institutions, mm -hmm. probably happened sometime in the mid 60s, uh, the class of 60, you know, people who were class of 69. So about 1960, 65, with the advent of the civil rights movement, and the kind of attention that it was getting, a lot of these institutions opened their doors more widely. And what was interesting is that I was uh, driven here from Des Moines, that's the closest airport, Des Moines, Iowa. And the person who drove me was talking about his experience as a townie, someone who grew up in Grinnell. And he said, imagine we are a white farming community and suddenly there are all these brown and black people coming into the campus. He said mm -hmm. it was a shock to us, you know, to have them in town. I will also say that it was from what I've been told, it was at that moment that we had a critical mass that the sheriff's department got riot rifles in their their cars. And so a lot of changes and transitions, we were the catalyst, you know, for that. And what I'm hoping is that at least for my class is that we commemorate uh, the, the contributions that black students did in uh, actually gave in pushing these institutions to become more diverse and inclusive. That is not language that was used back then, but clearly we were pushing for access we were pushing for the institutions to reflect our, our, our own history and culture. And a lot of the programs that are in place today, women's studies, LGBTQ studies, those programs would not exist were it not for the, the groundbreaking uh, efforts of Black students in which we actually wrote the curriculum you know, we used to joke and say, well, if we're, if, you know, because white, white professors were not interested in even updating themselves and learning about this. And we used to joke and say, well, if we can write a curriculum for Afro-American studies, mm -hmm. why can't they uh, just give us a degree? Mm -hmm. And ironically, even though the African-American studies concentration at Grinnell was the first of sort of minority scholarship it was the first to disappear. All the others have been endowed. Mm -hmm. So I understand that the college is now trying to make some form of reparations and is going to be uh, reestablishing the, uh, the Afro-American studies concentration, calling it Black and Diaspora uh, Studies, and uh, working on getting an endowed chair. 
Better late than never. And, and just one last point sure. is that the oldest Black alumni is 170 years old, and they have been honoring her. And she she actually grew up in Grinnell. Wow. Hmm. How old is she? 107 years old. She passed her 107th birthday this, uh, I think, last uh, this summer. Amazing. So yes. she's still there. And Great. still lucid. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, Irma, whenever we talk, I, I love listening to you and talking with you. I've said to you in the past that when you and I are on the phone, we talk until I get a headache. Because <laughs> uh, you, you keep stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking and telling stories and reflecting how complicated the world is. It complicated is. but manageable. And I wanted to, I wanted to speak to your reference to, you called him, Ar, I call him Armar. I used to teach his, his course mm -hmm. because I took one of my teachers and the person for whom I was the first research assistant was Chinua Achebe. And I took his African studies course in my African studies, African literature course in the 19, probably 1974. Mm -hmm. And I became Chinua Achebe's first research assistant. And so oh. I remember Armar, you know, Armar's mm -hmm. uh, book, mm -hmm. The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, teaching that along mm -hmm. with Ngugi, uh, who also was one of Chinua Achebe's uh, contemporaries. And when I think about you know, this this literature and what you were saying about the need for us to have multiple languages. One of the things that I did because I, I could not speak another language is that when my children started school, I made sure that they were enrolled in sort of the bilingual track. Mm -hmm. So as you know, my daughter is an artist and performer and Zena sings in multiple languages. She sings in Portuguese, she sings in Spanish, she sings in in Swahili, she sings in, uh, you know, Bambara. She has, she writes her music, her, her, her lyrics in English. And then she has friends who will translate mm -hmm. uh, them into Bambara. And, you know, that fluidity, linguistic fluidity is something that we really need to cultivate among our children. Mm -hmm. And she has fantastic art. Yes. I want a copy. I've never seen art like that. Al, it's unbelievable. And I passed it on to a friend of mine, Anna Gallega C. Reinhardt, who founded the Warehouse 21 Teen Art Center. Okay. And I was a board president, which was really kind of unusual in Santa Fe being black and a senior. Yes. But I have never seen art like that. It Thank is you. phenomenal. And everyone that I send it to said, who is she? Can we get copies? I never did get a response, but that's okay. No, no, no. I will actually put you in touch. She does do Gleesy prints of some of those pieces. And oh, so I will beautiful. find out from her. Yes. I've never seen anything like yeah. it. Well, and I would say her music is also as extraordinary. She plays the Cora and the bass ukulele, and she has blended what she calls what is African classical string music. And for those of you who don't know the Cora, it's like a gourd with a neck and it's played like a harp. And she's blended that on her, uh, on her CD with Western classical music, string music. You know, so it's an interesting synthesis of sound. Some of them are songs that she's done covers for. One is uh, a Finyaye, which is a song from Kenya, and then others where she's written her lyrics herself and actually had people translate them into a different language. Phenomenal. But Dr. Irma, that says a lot about you because during those decades for parents to have those types of expectations, putting our children in to different arenas where we were told <laughs> you don't belong while yes. we... we didn't tell our children that. And I don't think Maxine McFarland told her children that either. <laughs> and, and I remember very clearly, uh, I can tell you the day that I sort of went on a rampage. And that was the day my daughter came home in tears uh, because some of the kids called her Medusa. She was one of two or three black kids in this elementary school I because I had corn rolled her hair. 
And I, at that point, went on a rampage. And I remember contacting relatives and saying, don't you ever send a blonde Barbie to this house again. It will go in the garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, making sure that I had a subscription to Essence and to Ebony so that there would be things in the house. Because I think what we have done, you know, and Al, this speaks to what you were talking about. We have abdicated a lot of responsibility for cultural heritage preservation and transmission to schools. Yep. But what we forget is that schools, at least once they became desegregated, were really not designed to perpetuate and transmit our cultural heritage. And we what talked we also, about that yesterday. And also um, what we forget is that the integration the desegregation of schools and the integration that occurred was an integration of, of students, not, not teachers. teachers. Black teachers and the talent that we had in Black teachers who gave us not only the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also gave us access. I mean, I remember uh, eight, nine, ten years old, I was often asked to read poetry, and they were giving me the poems of Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks. So I was exposed to that early on. I didn't have to wait till the 60s. I was I memorized Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poetry, not just his dialect, but his poetry written in standard English. And, and, and you know, that that was something that these teachers made sure that I had access to. So when the 60s and 70s come and we're talking about you know, Black studies and what we need, I began to recognize how rich, you know, even though I grew up in an impoverished household, how rich my experience had been because I'd had that exposure. And I think that's what we need to get back to is that Black families, Black communities, uh, the organizations like the Phyllis Wheatley Center in Minneapolis, we need to get back to the business of transmitting the cultural heritage knowledge to our children and not assume that it is the responsibility of schools only. Well, it's also like the Haley Q. Brown Center in St. Paul, and that's yes. a big segue to bring in our friend, Jonathan Palmer. Jonathan, how you doing, buddy? I am doing good. Great to see everybody. Good I to love see you. the artwork, Dr. Irma. Thank you. Uh, you know what, Irma, if you've got some of your do- daughter's art on your computer, uh, maybe you can screen share. Uh, and, uh, let me just see, okay. If you do. And, and then, because uh, uh, Brenda certainly uh, gave it oh, a high, high recommendation, right? I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Dr. Irma, I wanted to tell you, I had just gotten out of graduate school in 1974, and I set up the African American Studies Program at Triton College. Uh, right outside of Chicago in in River Grove. I could teach there, but I couldn't live there. But I did teach Chinua Achebe's A Man of the People and um, what is the main, things fall apart. Yes. And even in 1974, we were talking about the world falling apart uh, for us, you know, and it was because this literature And having that history and that background was not there to look at our resilience and our strength and uh, and and the scholars in Timbuktu. I told Al I'm I'm celebrating a two year anniversary with him. My first article was August third, and it was on Timbuktu. Wow! And it was just great, uh, just to have. It was like you were feeling these scholars in the desert. Yes, yes. And writing their things in calligraphy and having the Taliban to want to steal it because it was so powerful. And I'm saying these are our brothers and our kids need to know that they survived in the desert and they were still scholars. Yes. And they discussed with each other who they were and 28th in Brooklyn and 28th in Indiana, our parents told us who we were. Yes. And our teachers, we had phenomenal teachers and a phenomenal principal. 
I sent Vash a, a picture of George Perry. He'll have to show it to you, Al. Mm. Unbelievable. But anyway, we I, I would love for them to see that art. Dr. Well, I have it. I have beautiful. I pulled it up online. Uh, so I don't know if I can, how I share screens on this one. Yeah, there's a uh, button at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, oh, that, share. Okay. Yeah, yeah in the last uh, share window. Share screen. Yeah. Okay. And let me see. And Jonathan, in a minute, I want to talk to give you, have you give us a debriefing on Scotland. I was getting ready and, to say. And also so this is, this is, this is her website. This is the visual art. It's ZainaCarlota.com. And these are some of her recent collages that she's oh, done. Oh, I hadn't seen those, Dr. Irma. Right. And so this is some of her artwork. Oh, that one. And I can tell you that this print here and this one I know are available as Gleesey prints because I've given them to people. At where? Uh, she, you would have to contact her. I can give okay, you her, you, and probably through her uh, email, uh, through okay. her website, there's a contact. This one is called Mama Wati. And so this one, so this one I have hanging in my home and this one I have. And this one is from her experience. You know, she taught for about six months in Ethiopia at a private school. And so her name is actually Amharic. It means she, uh, beautiful news. And so people often mistake her. I've had, I used to, when she was little, people used to stop me in the airport and swear that she was from Ethiopia or Somalia. Um, mm -hmm. Fabulous. And so these are just some, so this is where you can find it. And she's yeah. very influenced. This is influenced by an East Indian art form called Mithila, which a lot of village women do. And what you'll see in Mithila is that her work is highly detailed. And uh, she has an, her, her, her signature is having these borders around her work. She always has these borders. But Mithila, you'll see, like if you look at this piece here on Mamawate, um, see if I can increase it. Is trying to enlarge it. Um, is that you'll see that there are like little figure hands in between some of these down here. So mm -hmm. it's it's highly detailed. And what I would say is that all of these were done by hand. This is not computerized art. Uh, the collages up here are her beginning to do graphic design on computer and collages, but this art is all hand done. Beautiful. Well, put, put her uh, her website in the chat, Absolutely. so people can you know reach out to her and uh, perhaps acquire some of her work. Know. I want to come back to you and Brenda to ask you both to reflect on uh, your career as educators, as becoming educators, but also of the uh, the warrior spirit spirit that you both uh, possess and reflect. And I think it's significant. And Dr. Irma, I always love hearing you tell me stories about people in your life like James Baldwin. Uh, yes. He heroes of mine. So keep that in mind for a second and come back to that. And you guys think about that conversation. If Bill Jonathan, Street could talk. <laughs> Bill Street, well, I, I had the pleasure. I actually had the pleasure of cooking for James Baldwin. And as you know, many of my photographs of him mm -hmm are actually on the Black Presence at UMass website. They've used that. I've taken, I have about 51 photos of him, photos of Sonia Sanchez, because I was at the University of Massachusetts, which at that moment in time in 1973 had the second Black chancellor in the entire country mm -hmm. and the first Black chancellor in the state of Massachusetts. So Randolph Bromery, whom they've now named the Fine Arts Center afterwards, brought this concentration of people like Chinua Achebe, um, uh, Max Roach, Archie Shep, Nelson Stevens, who is one of the founders of Afro Cobra, which was the arts movement. And it was sort of a waylay station because UMass Amherst is part of the five college community. So mm -hmm. Sonia Sanchez was teaching at Amherst College. You had people like Roberto Marquez, who, was, who used to translate Nicholas Guillen's poetry, who was teaching at Hampshire. Uh, 
later Andrew Salky, who was a Jamaican of Jamaican descent, British uh, writer who used to actually work for the BBC and who would interview people like Langston Hughes and others when they came through the UK. And so he ultimately came to Amherst. So it was quite a constellation and concentration. And if you go to my photographs, Tony Cade Bambara came through there. Uh, Alice Walker came through there. We had James Baldwin's 60th birthday party at UMass Amherst. And I have a wonderful image of Maya Angelou sitting in the audience, you hmm. know, watching the proceedings. So it's it was quite a, a time period to, to be there. Did you know well, Archie Shep? Did you know Archie Shep? I did. I mean, I don't know him. Per I mean, I knew him. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he he was that figure, Max Roach. I used to, when I first had my first child, Antonio, I used to take Antonio to Max Roach's con con concerts and nurse him uh, in the concert. So I guess the love of music was early on. They used to have the Bright Moments Jazz Festival mm -hmm. where Billy Taylor uh, mm -hmm. used to come and play. And I went to school with Billy Taylor's son. He was, he passed away um, early, very early in life, but Dwayne Taylor was one of my classmates. He was part of that 18 mm -hmm. that was here. So I got to know Billy Taylor a little bit too, when he would come to campus and visit his son. Amazing. You know, so it's it's been that experience. And Al, you may not remember, but I actually wrote a kind of by uh, you know, an obituary about Chinua Achebe for Insight mm -hmm. News. So yep. it's it's there. Yep. And I begin by saying this is personal because he was such a gentle soul and mm -hmm. such a good spirit. And I would say that if you want to find out about translating things to Yoruba, his son continues to do the work, which was Chinua's vision, which was to create a dictionary of Yoruba mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is the language that is spoken by more people than any other language in the world. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes, it is the largest spoken language because the number of Nigerians yeah. is an, an, a huge population. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, it is the, that was part of why he wanted to create a dictionary for it. Wow. And his son- Even more than Chinese or Indian as well? I believe, well, I don't know, because remember in Chinese, you have ethnicities- Several and different languages that, that right. make up Chinese, so right. this is by a single group. And if it's not the largest, it is among the largest spoken well, language. That, and that's the motivation behind trying to uh, innovate with a community newspaper that really can be, uh, positioning community as a global experience because That's of te technology, right? And so if we are presenting something in in Portuguese, in English, in Spanish, in Yoruba, and perhaps in either Swahili or because it's Minnesota, we could do it in, in um, Somali. But if you've done that, you've reached uh, a whole bunch of African people around the planet. That's yes, the idea. you have. And I think there is something to be said. Uh, the Caribbean Studies Association is an organization I've belonged to for years, and they've always had their newspaper, their newsletter published, mm -hmm. and it is printed in English, translated into Haitian Creole, mm -hmm. and also into Spanish, and mm -hmm. sometimes into Dutch. And so that is a pattern that whatever is put in there is always in three, at least Available. the other two languages. And I think you would find with the Association of Black Anthropologists and probably the Association of African Anthropologists that you would find people who might be willing to help with that, to assist with the awesome. translation work. Awesome. Jonathan, uh, talk about Scotland, man. Uh, it was simply amazing. Uh, so I was gone for about 11 days. Uh, what was uh, really wonderful was getting a chance to uh, head over there, connect. My Scottish clan was going for our annual general meeting, AGM. Uh, and so every three years we do this in Scotland. Uh, it was Clan McFarlane. Uh, and so uh, we headed over there. One of the early parts uh, that we had was the Highland Gathering, which was uh, bringing together uh, a group of clans six Highland clans that had formerly been uh, enemies uh, or rivals and saying, hey, let's all work together and uh, promote our common heritage and have that be something that is great um, 
to come together. So we had that, uh, a group coming together. We had some uh, friendly Highland games and our clan ended up being the one that won. Uh, the I'm trying to see if I can, sh I was gonna share a picture, but mm -hmm. I may not be able to get over to that because I'm on this, the stream here. But um, what was really good was, was being able to come together. And actually I got interviewed by the BBC uh, who was covering both that event and um, the uh, aspect for um, Clan Buchanan is installing a chief this year, and that hasn't happened in uh, 300 years. Wow. And so um, it's it's a lot of big things. But then there was also this black guy in a kilt uh, who they came over and decided to interview me, and I talked to uh, you know about being involved and connected in. Um, it's been for me a very enriching experience. You know, I, I come from an interracial background and honor both sides of my heritage. And one of the fascinating pieces is that the white side of my family actually lives vicariously through me. They get their information <laughs> about this. I'm the only one who has been back to Scotland. Our family is from a small town called Dunkeld, which I go back to uh, every time I visit. And um, you would only know it for one of three reasons. Uh, Macbeth is set there. Uh, the it was a religious center of the times for several hundred years because Dunkeld Cathedral, and then Beatrix Potter wrote Peter Rabbit and her other stories on vacation there because she was inspired by the oh, land. Yes. Um, you sent me some pictures from was it Scotland or Ireland yeah. when you were there? Was no, it? I was in Scotland. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was just writing that my last name is actually Scottish, they believe that. The yep. double C, so Mick simply means son of, Lauren means Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And so when I was talking to someone at one of the castles, she said, depending on the literacy, MCL and MCCL, it depends on what they heard because most people weren't literate enough. Right. So what I did discover, uh, getting into the Scottish archives in Glasgow is like trying to get into like, you know, security down and I talked to the guy for about an hour and finally said, oh, just go ahead and you have to leave everything. And so I was able to go there and discovered that there were Scottish farmers who came to North Carolina. And according to my DNA, mine originates in North Carolina, even though my father's from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And from there they spread out. Now I have encountered North Carolinians white, whose name is Mick Lauren, MC capital L. And that's how most people misspell my name. And there is a Lauren Berg, North Carolina, and I am convinced that it probably is a derivative of Mick Lauren, you know, at some point. The other thing that I found was that um, the Scottish used to send their political prisoners to Barbados. And so when I was traveling, I was traveling with a Barbadian and we're in a taxi and this guy is speaking this Scottish brogue. And she says, oh, that sounds just like home. So the Patois in Barbados, is actually a Scottish brogue. And her name is, she's part Scottish. And she discovered the village like you did of where the family name came from. So she went on that journey to discover that. Well, and also so um, a lot of times we pull in, um, I just put in Clan McLaurin USA. So that's the society. So each clan has their clan and then most of them have a society nonprofit that kind of organizes. And uh, Dr. Emma is exactly right in terms of how the names got spelled, but it goes even further into some will say MAC, some will say MC, some will like ours is McFarland. So uh, the way yours is spelled, Al, is the same way my family spelled it. Mm -hmm. um, and all that could be is somebody wrote it down the wrong way. Yes. Some of them are F-A-R-L-I-N. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are F-A-R-L-A-N-E or wow. L-A-I-N-E. So a lot of times we tell people when they're tracing genealogy, don't get caught up in the spelling. It has to do with where you're from, where your family would have been. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of these pieces that then connect in. So I got involved about, uh, we're almost going on, it's been over 15 years that I got involved with the society, um, started uh, becoming an officer. I'm an officer with the group. And um, 
we are what's called an armidurous clan. And that means that we do not have a chief. Our chiefly line died out without an heir. However, one of the projects that I keep trying to pitch Al on, and I'm going to push him now, especially, um, is our chief's brother departed from Scotland and went to Jamaica. And then nobody knows what happened to him after that. And with Al's family being from Jamaica and being McFarland, I would bet you that there is a connection. And I think there's a great <laughs> story there, tracing those roots, um, tracing some of mine and, and seeing where all the connections are. Uh, so all around, we went up to Loch Ness, um, which let me tell you, I always was wondering how come they just don't take sonar and go out <laughs> and this monster? It's gotta be easy. I thought Loch Ness was like the, the size of Bidet Mascot. No. First of all, Loch Ness is 23 miles. Oh. That, that's just your start. It is fed in by the river Ness and it empties out into the sea. And then there are underground uh, tunnels that go between that lock and other locks. So it makes a lot more sense mm. why you can't find Nessie. And <laughs> because Nesty's lot. not there, Jonathan. Oh, oh, I think Nessie is there keeping watch on, on the Scotland. And Come the on. Hey. And also, I think what we forget is that some of these divisions between Scotland and Ireland are artificial divisions that came after wars. So I've been told when I was in Scotland that MC capital C is more like an Irish spelling and so it's probably northern Scotland where they border each other. And so we have to understand that a lot of these countries that we talk about, many of these borders are colonial borders or they're post-war borders. And so they're really artificial. And so people were fluid. They were moving back and forth. You know, it's, it's, it's like Tennessee. You, you know, you can stand in Tennessee and be in five states, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Uh, and so I think we have to remember that as well and not be so rigid, as you were saying, about the spelling, but also about the geography, you know? Very true. And actually, the, the running joke we have is that Irish and Scots are just cousins who could swim. Yeah, they, they <laughs> I love it. Run. And so you, you do have families who left Scotland, settled in Ireland or left Ireland, settled in Scotland, and then, as, as Dr. Ermer said, came over to the United States. A lot of Scots and a lot of Irish came in and settled in the southern United States, and they had uh, the Highland Clearances in, in the mid-1700s is when they went through and uh, the, the English basically killed any Scots that they could find. So you see a lot of that happening. Right. Um, I visited uh, Culloden, which was the final battle of the, the Jacobite uprising, which was an attempt to get um, Scotland back under uh, the, the Scottish crown. Uh, so you have a lot of pieces of um, crossover. You even have some levels of similarity between how the Scots and how the Irish retreated and how African-Americans retreated not to the level of what we've had in terms of slavery, but just in terms of being colonized and being oppressed by another group. Um, so- Jonathan, stop there for a second. So how do you uh, consider or reconcile the uh, really complicated relationships between uh, Scotch and Irish Americans and black people out of the South? So many of us in this country have Mac, you know, McDaniels, McThis, McThat, name so the scottish irish naming uh is common and pervasive among african americans and the question is what was the relationship uh during american slavery with our people and the scotch and the irish one idea is that you know we know that the irish uh were poor farmers you know scotch hillbillies and people were all poor together but there are some who probably were involved in the trade or in the supervising of uh, of, uh, of enslaved people. So how do how do you study that? Look at it from from where you are. Well, and and it's it's a fascinating topic. And one thing I want to say is is it's Scott or Scottish. Scotch is a drink. 
And so <laughs> just just to be clear, because if you say that in Scotland, they they will look at you the wrong way. Uh -huh. um, what is fascinating, and, and I've been exploring a lot of this uh, already in, in terms of looking, I think what you see is kind of the same things you're going to see with white populations in the South. You're going to have some that are on the right side and you're going to have some that are on the wrong side. Um, th there's a piece in there. Um, I've started, there was a documentary that came out uh, not too long ago that traced kind of the Scottish roots of the Ku Klux Klan, of saying, wait a minute, Klan, there's got to be some connection. Um, and I'm, just to sum up, what it found was that when the KKK was first started, the first iteration of it was not a racist organization. It was a social club and it was to socialize. That then died out. Um, and what we started from that is what you get with Nathan Bedford Forrest and the White Knights and everything. And you see this transformation into this racist organization. But what you have is some of the elements that tie back into Klan heritage, which is very interesting. First, they're calling themselves the Klan. Second, um, things like the Burning Cross. There was a thing called the Fury Cross that was used to signal announcements in the Highlands, um, you know, if the chief's son was born. So there's, there's a lot that I'm working right now to unpack and look at that and see what it is like that where the, where the things changed, where did white people become white as it was mm -hmm. and, and separate back? There are some who recognized knew about the oppression that they had been through. And so they didn't visit that upon uh, the African-Americans. Some were part of the Underground Railroad and connected into that. But then there are others who were part of the slave system who would have been overseers. Um, most that came over were not wealthy. Uh, they were very poor and, and you know, started out as sharecroppers or, or farmers in those states. So it's a lot to unpack. And I, I approach it very carefully because I have already found in some Irish roots um, that are that go back from my grandmother's side, uh, they used at one point, this person put together, a distant cousin put together a genealogy book in the 70s and 80s, and they used slave tags to connect a father to a son so that they could go ahead and show this is the connection. You know, they didn't have the birth certificates, so instead they used slave tags. and. The day I came across that, that was that was a very hard day uh, mm. looking at that kind of thing. Um, so it's it's a lot to unpack, Alan. I'm still you know piecing the the parts together, but remembering that this is history and pieces that we need to acknowledge and look at and understand fully. Yeah, Brenda. I've added a couple of names to Maud Souter, who is someone who uh, I came across her work and I've actually used some of quotes from her. She's passed away, but she was of Scottish and, and Ghanaian descent. And one of the things. Mm -mm. What happened? I know she was, uh, Dr. She her battery was saying her battery was running low. Yeah. Hey, okay. That might have been it. Yeah. Maybe she's got a recharge right there. What's interesting is Hallie Quinn Brown actually had uh, Scottish uh, descent. Um, her grandmother was actually a Scottish um, woman, had a plantation, and was involved with her grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there is history there. Uh, looking back as I've used my DNA, um, my Scottish side is actually part of my largest percentage. Mm -hmm. um, it is the largest single percentage in terms of the DNA within me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the when it goes into groups, it becomes even higher. So uh, it, it is something that I enjoy being connected to. Clan McFarland is a very open and welcoming clan. You know, I've never had anybody bat an eye. Um, there are some people who still within the Scottish community don't understand what brown people are doing, being a part of that. But there's a lot more of us uh, throughout the states that have become tracing our roots, getting connected, getting our kilts um, and showing up at the events and being a part of it. They're Brenda, always so. If, if I say, uh, do you know who Big Red is? Does that name ring a bell with you? 
That does. Um, um, and Brenda in particular, though. Brenda, are you familiar with the word Big Red? Just Big, from chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> Big, Red, Big Red was this cop in Kansas City. Oh, you told me about him. Who would, who would pick us up and take us 20 miles or 15 All miles outside of town yep. and say, okay, you can walk back. Yep. You know, and he would uh, basically, and I never, that didn't happen to me, but he happened to others that I knew about anyway. Mm -hmm. Irma's back. Irma, you lost me for a second. Before we run out of time, mm -hmm. just want to tell you they're talking about a third political party. Came Saw up this, this morning. morning. Yeah, just we got just, five minutes. We got five minutes. We got five minutes. So we got thought it was rather interesting. And my former students are the ones that pointed it out to me. Uh, boy, they are in tune. They might be a little disappointed that Yusef's not on today because they had a list of questions for mm -hmm. for the lawyers. But um, yeah, a third party. So that's going to be an interesting political who, lens. Who's talking about that? Who? Well, it's 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 called the Forward Party, um, and two of the people that are at the front is um, Andrew the Asian Yang guy, and uh, what is her name? Christine, the EPA woman. I'm trying to remember her name. Christine Todd Whitman. Mm -hmm. um, so there, the the idea behind it is. People on both sides who are tired of the um, animosity and tired of the fighting and have decided to, to put in for this party. Um, it's been pointed out, you know, third parties don't have the best luck in terms of surviving. Although a lot of that, what's fascinating is, is you go back into really 18th and, and 19th century, you start seeing a lot more parties than you do, you know, today. It didn't used to just be two parties. It was, you know, you had the Whigs and you had, you know, the this group of Republicans and the separate group of Republicans, the Dixiecrats and all sorts of things. And you see how uh, they change over time. I mean, the the Democrats used to be the, the very racist ones. Yeah. Uh, and the Republicans, Party of Lincoln, were the ones that uh, right. were actually very supportive of civil rights. Uh, Hallie Quinn Brown spoke before the 1924 Republican National Convention. Um, and that was a time when that it was right after women got the right to vote. And it was one where she was very active within that party. But this is different. The um, I think the hearings have spurred them on because mm -hmm. they are just totally appalled that this went down and that Trump is still walking around and campaigning. But I think the other thing is that they have a lot of big money. Mm -hmm. I'm talking billions. Mm -hmm. So who knows? The money and, and to that extent, there is a, there's a new organization. It used to be the, uh, I think it was the American Heritage Center that funded a lot of work, but there's a new organization that many of Trump followers are going to. And these people are investing a lot of money into podcasts and giving them the technical and professional mm -hmm. assistance so that they can get their message out. Yep. And it's you, serious. Yes. And, and we're not seeing the same thing uh, happening on the so-called progressive left or the democratic party. Uh, they're not supporting, uh, you know, BPOC, uh, you know, people whose ideas may be somewhat radical, um, they're not supporting them in the same way. And so there is a, a whole marketing and I would say uh, communications strategy it's that big. is taking place. Yeah, it's big. You know, so anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it, it, it's it's a good point, and and you know to to Dr. Irma's point, I mean that's one of the things you saw with the organizing around January sixth is that it was a bunch of the podcasts yes. and a bunch of the small radio shows that were telling the message of of Trump to to come there for January sixth that it was going to be the next yes. civil war. So as the hearings have gone on, they've showed a lot of this and a lot of the stuff that went by everybody on yes. average because we don't listen to that podcast or that radio station um so it's it's very interesting 
you know, Irma, I was telling in, uh, in, Al. In, in recent I'm weeks, uh, Irma, we've talked about um, the likelihood or possibility of a civil war. Given this uh, observation, what do the three of you think uh, the future holds? Uh, I tend to, uh, I think I said this before, um, uh, doubt that the society is going to move to open armed internal conflict. But I also say that saying that I, I could be wrong, real wrong. Uh, Irma, what do you think? Brenda, what do you think? Jonathan, what do you think? I don't think we're there yet. No. Uh, I, I believe that the public sentiment, no one wants to see a war happen. Um, I think somebody does want to see one. Well, I, I, well <laughs> let, let, let me put this, is that the no general right population. A Ted Cruz and a Josh Harlan. Yeah, but, but, but these are politicians, you know, who, who, who I think their bark is worse than their bite. They bluff a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that there aren't insurgents, that there aren't. Obviously, we've seen what happened in, in, in uh, Charleston. We saw what happened in Buffalo. We see the kind of nonchalant with which uh, happened in, in Texas, where, you know, the white policemen, 200 people, policemen, you know, and Border Patrol people stood by while children were being massacred because it wasn't their children. Right. Those children didn't look like them. And so they took their time. So that kind, but that is not, that is not atypical of what has happened in America. America is just rife with contradiction. And one of the fundamental contradictions is that we don't always practice the democracy that we speak about. Mm -hmm. And But I don't know that we're on the verge of civil war. Do, is it going to get challenging? Well, we've seen, you know, remember, we had lynching. You know, remember that we had segregation. But the thing about this is that we as a people, as Black people, have advanced to the point you can't put that genie back in the box. Mm -hmm. We're not going to tolerate people treating us as second-class citizens. But I think the trauma that goes along with encountering those kinds of things, I don't think that today's Black parents or parents of mixed-race kids who may phenotypically look Black are preparing their children for it. So these Enough. children encounter this opposition and they don't have the resilient tools. They don't have an understanding of their own history and how they put their place in that history. People want their children just to be a human being. Well, there's no such animal without culture. Mm -hmm. Everybody is situated, no matter who they are, where they are in the world. There is no universal individual that is outside of some cultural grounding, some cultural situation. <laughs> right. Wait, and so you me. have to you have to let your children know who they are and where they come from. And not telling them does not make it go away. Brenda, go ahead. Ahead. let's pose with you, Jonathan, but Brenda first, go ahead. No, I I think uh, Dr. Irma said everything that I was thinking. I do feel this is different though. I believe what came out of that last segment of the hearings woke a lot of people up. And that might be the surge for the third party. I don't know. All I know is that those of us who love children are concerned yes. because of their future. And your grandchildren, Al, you know, if they didn't have a strong, supportive family, they'd be lost because they're not getting it in that classroom. That's right. That's why Adrian was so important yesterday, Al, with Project Success. Yes. Uh, that was that was just great. Uh, she and Laura are doing well. beautiful work. I, I think to, to, uh, to Irma's point, um, I had the talk with my daughter. Uh, I know my friends are still doing that. I agree. There's a lot of people who just want their kids to be human, and we're not there yet. And even just being human means recognizing cultural differences and honoring them versus de denigrating them. In terms of civil war, Alec, you, I hope that we're not going to get there, but I worry that I know that there's a segment of our population that wants that. I know that that is something that has been continually pushed by the former president and by his acolytes. 
And what brings me, I mean, you can go back to the Obama administration when they were saying, Obama's going to take your guns, which encouraged all those groups to go out and buy more guns. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there was a push to stockpile at that point. We may never get there, but I know that if we do, it is not going to go down the way that group thinks it is. That's right. This is a very new day and age. There is a lot more people on the side of right and a lot more people on the side of justice. And there's a lot more black and brown people who understand and know how to use weaponry if we have to do that, but also know how to take care of their community, to build coalitions. And I think as a whole, as Dr. Armour said, America doesn't want that. And America would be, if it did happen, it would be a short-lived battle that would go right back down as they saw. It was not an easy thing to do. Just like with January 6th, all those people who went thought they were in the right and nothing was going to happen. And now as they're ending up in jail, yep. and now as they're ending up on the news, one, they're finding out it's not as easy. And two, they're learning why the grandparents wore hoods. <laughs> Listen, uh, out of time, what a great conversation. So good to be with each of you. And great, we'll see you great. Next time. Irma, next time, let's talk about, uh, you're going to be in town in September. Yes, the, September 15th, yes. For the 15th anniversary of uh, Europe's Europe. Energy Day, right? Yes. So let's talk about that next week, okay? That That'd sounds good. That sounds right. good. And let's connect about that. Okay. Looking forward to it. Take All care. Right. Take care. We'll see you. Jonathan, I need to get a hold of you.